Let's take a look at Q2 from section 3.2. In this example, we've been given a coefficient matrix A. We'd like to find its eigenvalues, its eigenvectors, and use those two pieces of information to try and sketch a graph of its phase plane. We'll break this up into each of its three parts here. First, we'd like to find the eigenvalues. To find eigenvalues, we are always going to compute the determinant of A minus lambda I equal to zero. This means we have a determinant of a matrix. What matrix? The matrix A minus lambda I. Once we've computed the determinant, which will give us a characteristic polynomial, that characteristic polynomial will be set equal to zero. The roots of the characteristic polynomial will then be our eigenvalues. Here, we've got two minus lambda, two, one, three minus lambda. Remember that I is the identity matrix. And so when we multiply i by a constant of lambda, it just becomes lambda zero, zero lambda. We can see that we have subtracted off the lambdas on the main diagonal here. We're interested in taking the determinant of this matrix and setting it equal to zero. One thing I want to point out that's going to happen pretty much every single time you do this is that you're always going to have your variable lambda as the second term. We're about to write some factored form looking polynomials, and I always like to have things that look more like x plus 2 times x plus 3. I always like to have my variable first. So notice here that if I were to factor out a negative from the first term and factor out a negative from the second term, then when I go to write my AD minus BC, our determinant format here, I can really write this as lambda minus 2, a negative has been factored out of this term, times lambda minus 3. Since I've factored a negative out of both, those negatives have both canceled out front. So this should be equivalent to the product of those two terms. We also want to subtract off the product of our off diagonal. So it's going to be a minus 2 equals 0. And now we just want to solve this quadratic. So I'm going to look here to see lambda squared minus 5 lambda plus 6 minus 2 equals 0. These are going to combine to give us a plus 4. And we can factor this. To arrive at the eigenvalues of lambda 1 is 1 and lambda 2 is 4. In general, I won't really care which way you number the eigenvalues out here. It's good to number them because each eigenvalue is associated with its own eigenvector, so we'd like to keep them associated with partner pairs. Lambda 1 V1, lambda 2 V2. As long as they correspond, I'm okay with that. In certain settings, people have preferences as to maybe like descending order for their naming scheme out there. I'm not too worried about it here, but you should always give subscripts on your lambdas here. So now we found our eigenvalues to be 1 and 4 associated with this A matrix. And what we would now like to do is find our eigenvectors. So we're going to return to our def defining statement here associated with eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Anything that is an eigenvalue eigenvector pair should agree with this equality right here associated with their matrix A. What we would like to do is solve for V in this sense. We've determined what values of lambda we believe should work here. We want to know what vector V is going to make this work out for us. As with any algebra solving that you've ever done, if there's V in two different locations and you're solving for V, then we would like to group all the V's together. We're trying to collect like terms here. So I'm going to go ahead and subtract lambda V to the other side. And I'm going to go ahead and factor out V. Again, remember that we don't get uh, the... Um, the commutative property when we're in linear algebra land out here. Matrix multiplication, vector multiplication, it matters what order we do those things in. Um, and so since V was on the right, I'm going to leave V on the right. But it looks like what we want to do here is we're looking to solve for V. So I'm going to compute what is A minus lambda I with each particular lambda. We'll have an unknown vector V. And what we know that we're interested in is that solution uh, of this product being equal to zero. So we will find a representative vector that will cause this to go to zero here. So let's go ahead and do this. In the case where our lambda is one, we can build our A minus lambda I matrix as two minus one, three minus one. Notice that we are subtracting off lambda on the main diagonal, just like we were doing a moment ago. This should be multiplied by some unknown vector right here. Typically I use different letters here, but that's really just so I distinguish between other letterings that we're using throughout the course of the problem. So I'll write this as a UV. 
and we know that we are interested in this being equal to the zero vector over here, zero, zero. So with a little bit of simplification, I can see that we have one, two, one, two. And very importantly, and you should recognize this from some of the previous examples, you should notice that this is redundant information. Typically, when we think of a system of linear equations, we think of there being at one point in space where they intersect. But here, what we're going to repeatedly see every single time is this redundant information here. Each row is actually telling us the same information. So there's not just going to be one solution. These are the same lines. We're just going to get one whole line's worth of solutions. All we need to do is describe one vector that lives on that line. So here, what I'm thinking to myself, what value of u, v makes sense? Well, I'm seeing here with a little bit of matrix multiplication, this looks to me like one copy of u plus two copies of v needs to be zero. Um, I think in this case, if I let u be negative two, one times negative two, and v be one, two times positive one, then we'll get a negative two and a positive two to cancel and give me zero. A couple things about this. One, this eigenvector that I've just found is one of an infinite number of eigenvectors that goes with lambda. We typically just always want to give the simplest representative of the family. Any constant multiple is going to work out here as well. When I say the simplest representative of the family, what I really mean is pretty typically I try to make sure that one of the two values in my eigenvector is one almost always. I don't know. I guess I try and avoid fractions, but in this case here, I could have totally picked one and negative one half because that's also a constant multiple of this vector. If you multiply this vector by negative a half, then you'll get positive one in the top, you'll get negative a half on the bottom down there. So any constant multiple is acceptable. It's just pretty typical to give the, the simplest form right there. So this is what we're gonna go ahead and call our V1 vector right here. Now let's do the same thing for lambda two equals four. Again, we're looking for the eigenvector that is associated with the eigenvalue of four. I'm going to go ahead and look at my a minus lambda i matrix. 2 minus 4, 2, 1, 3 minus 4. Again, times uv equals 0, 0. Again, we're just going to simplify our matrix and do a little bit of visual inspection based on some light matrix multiplication. Here, we're going to see that we get negative 2, 2, and 1, negative 1. Again, you should recognize that this is redundant information. The top row is exactly the same equivalent to the bottom row. They're just constant multiples of one another. What I'm seeing here, we have a much easier choice, I think, to see in this case right here. Notice that if we let u be positive 1, then we get positive 1 times negative 2. If we let v be positive 1, then we get positive 1 times positive 2 is positive 2. Negative 2 and positive 2 will take us to 0. And so I think that 1, 1 is a good eigenvector here. And this is what we would now call our V2, our second eigenvector. Uh, I don't think that we can really argue about whether or not that's the simplest form. That's definitely the best way to write our, our base case eigenvector that's associated with, uh, with this guy here. This one, maybe some other formats might be good. We'll maybe have some light debate about that. But in this case, certainly the simplest way that I could state my second eigenvector. But then again, if you were to tell me that negative 18, negative 18 is your eigenvector, you'd be right because that is a constant multiple of the uh, eigenvector as I've stated it here. So it looks like now we found our eigenvalues, we find our eigenvectors, we'd like to see how can we use these two pieces of information to help us graph the phase plane here. In part C, I just asked you to graph the two straight line solution parts, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about part D here, about how do we know about what the remaining trajectories look like. Now let's go ahead and graph our phase plane. Given the matrix A, we first found our eigenvalues to be 1 and 4. We found the corresponding eigenvectors that pairs up with each of these eigenvalues. Our first eigenvalue of 1 had an eigenvector of negative 2, 1. Our second eigenvalue of 4 had an eigenvector of 1, 1. Remember what we're even doing here. This section is entitled straight line solutions for a reason. What we're hunting for is where are these straight line solutions as opposed to all the curvy trajectories that are within our phase plane. 
What we've done is we've found exactly where they are located by finding these two eigenvalue eigenvector pairs. Particularly the eigenvectors are telling us where they are located. The eigenvalues are telling us what behavior will we experience along those straight line trajectories. So I'm going to draw my easy one first. V2 is the vector 1, 1. So if I'm picturing just the vector 1, 1, you should picture this as our vector. That is the vector going from 0, 0 to the point 1, 1. I'm going to be a little bit careful with my arrows here. I know that my trajectories should often have arrows indicating uh, direction of flow, not just the tip of a vector point. So I'm going to erase that for right now. But what we found is that all vectors on this line are going to be part of a straight line solution. So there's one of my straight line solutions. It's all solutions that land on the locations that are defined by the vector 1, 1, and all of its constant multiples. Very similarly, v1 is the vector negative 2, 1. So I want to draw the line that's associated with this. So all I've got to do is go 2 to the left and up 1. And so I might think to myself, that right there is the vector negative 2, 1. But I'm not just looking to draw that vector. I'm remembering that all constant multiples of this vector should be good as well. So again, I'm going to get rid of my arrow on the end of that line right there. But it should be the case that this line here of slope negative 1 half is our second straight line solution associated with this system. So I know where the solutions are based on my eigenvectors, but what I don't know is how the behavior is on those lines. Fortunately, my eigenvalues are going to help us out with this. What we've seen is that these eigenvalues seem to end up corresponding to the coefficients on our exponential terms in our solutions. In particular, this lambda 1 of 1 is going to result in a term of e to the t. What I know is that this represents exponential growth. And so what I am expecting to see is that as time moves on, values will get larger that are associated with this eigenvector here. So my lambda 1 of 1, I expect to be a growth eigenvector, or excuse me, eigenvalue. And it should be doing that all in the direction of v1 here. So what I'm expecting to see is source behavior along the straight line solution associated with eigenvalue, eigenvector 1. Very, very similarly, I have lambda 2 of 4. That's going to result in terms in our solutions that are going to look like e to the 4t. What I know about this is this also represents exponential growth, but it represents a power of 4 faster growth than this guy over here, which will become relevant in a second. As for right now, since we don't typically sort of measure the speed of growth when we just draw our arrows, we just want to know growth or decay, it seems like as well as the arrows that we drew on this guy, we should also be experiencing growth or source type behavior along the 1, 1 uh, eigenvector line. So these are the two easy parts of my phase plane. Remember that our whole hunt here was to say if we can find any two solutions, they're going to have linear combinations that form all the rest of our solutions. So we found the easiest two solutions, the straight line solutions. Unfortunately, what's not really obvious to me here is how do I go about completing my phase plane? And here's the thing that I would like to suggest to you. I think I do agree that if a point starts there, it's certainly going to remain in this sort of quadrant of the graph uh, indefinitely. But what's not clear to me is if I start a point right here, should I expect that point to do something like this, or should I expect to do something like this? Notice that there's sort of like a concavity question that we're asking right here. Which of these flows do we feel like is the one that's more appropriate? So here's the argument that I'd like to make. I'm gonna, we'll talk about this a couple more times in section 3.3. Uh, I think that this idea is a little bit easier to think of in reverse. If you were to think of these as being negative one and negative four, e to the negative t, e to the negative four t, all of our arrows being pointing inwards rather than pointing outwards, that would help. And therefore you're gonna see that in an example in 3.3 out here. But here's the argument I like to make for myself. What I know is that as time goes on, both of these values are gonna get large. But what I know for sure is that this value is going to get way, way larger than this value is going to get over here as time gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So what that says to me is that the eigenvalue of 4 should really end up dominating the behavior of this graph once time has reached a very large value. So what that says to me is that the further out we go in time, the more our graph should be agreeing with V2. 
So what that means to me is that far away, when t values are large, after lots of time has passed, I expect my trajectories to mostly look like this one because I know that this behavior is going to very much dominate this behavior. It's not even gonna really take that much time for that to be the case out here. We get a power of four larger terms here than we do here. These are associated with the eigenvector of one, one in this case. And so what I'm expecting is that in the long run, I expect my trajectories out wide to be matching what uh, this is my V2 is doing here. So as I said a second ago, and so again, I think I'm trying to match my V2 here, like in the long run, but notice I'm drawing these extra parts far away from the origin, not near our starting, uh, our, our initial time values maybe. So the question is, what should this be doing more closer to the origin? That's really the stuff I'm trying to pin down. Well, again, as I said a second ago, I like to think about this in reverse time. If we were thinking of this in reverse time, then we would have e to the negative t, e to the negative 4t. What you should know about e to the negative 4t is it's going to decay much, much, much faster than e to the negative t is. All of our arrows would be pointing the opposite direction. We'd be sinking towards the origin here. And in this reverse scenario, I think it's a little bit easier for me to picture the idea that as time, uh, when time is small, this is going to not necessarily show a huge difference between these two. Uh, but what I'm thinking is if we started far away and as time went on in our reverse system here, then it should be that we're going to very, very much decay along the V1 axis. That'll be our dominant decay. So that would be bringing us in like this. Once we get closer, then this guy has decayed quite a bit. Once our, our, our locations are closer to the origin, our values aren't going to be as incomparable as they have been before and we're going to then follow in the weaker of the two trajectories into the origin. Uh, and the same thing will happen here. All I've really done when I keep on talking about this backwards time is introduce a negative. So what we're gonna end up seeing here is that our trajectories are always going to, in a sense, leave the origin essentially parallel to our weaker of our two eigenvalues path because in the long run, we should expect them to agree with the dominant eigenvectors path. So I think this is my more complete drawing of this system here. And again, the question that was unclear to us is, should we exit the origin following V2's behavior or should we leave the origin, oh, I mislabeled right here. Sorry, this is my V1. Should we be leaving the origin following V1's behavior or V2's behavior? Ultimately, our conclusion is going to be in any source setting like this, we will always exit the origin following the weaker of our two eigenvectors, weaker because the eigenvalue is smaller, because in the long run, in the long run, our behavior should be very much dominated by the stronger eigenvalue. And notice here, I'm drawing vectors that are essentially parallel to V2 because most of our behavior should be in the V2 direction the further and further we go out in time.